Hey, what's up, ladies and gentlemen? In this episode, we have Jonathan Perrin, uh, someone who I've got to know over the past couple of years, uh, doing amazing things in the money management space, former baseball player uh, for the Kansas City Royals organization. I'm excited to have him on. You know, he's been a contributor, a Team Frugal member. You know, you can catch his blogs on our article. Um, but, you know, enough about, you know, him. I, wanted, I want you guys to hear it for yourself. Uh, so, Jonathan, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Amobi. Thanks for having me on. I'm super excited to get a chance to chop it up with you a little bit today, getting to talk with the original frugal athlete. So uh, I'm really excited. I've been looking forward to this one. No, respect. And, and, you know, talk to us about, you know, how's your new year going? I know you, we, offline we talked about how busy it is. Um, I know we're going to get into context, your story a little bit, but talk about how your new year is going. Uh, first well, New Year's been great. Just uh Glad to put 2020 in the rearview mirror, as are, I'm sure, a lot of people. Uh, it was a big year of transition for me with uh, retiring officially from professional baseball and, and moving on to, to the next chapter in my life, my career. Uh, and then going into the first couple of weeks of 21, just been meeting with a lot of clients, getting planning done, getting, getting out in front of the 2021 and just uh, trying to get, get a good plan going forward for the rest of the year to make sure that our clients have some clear goals to accomplish and that we uh we have a plan in place to to make sure those happen no respect and talk about that you know you mentioned you're in a new chapter but bring it bring us back before uh, we're starting the book of Jonathan Parent what does that look like what's your journey what's your background yeah absolutely so uh, I was born and raised in Olathe Kansas uh, just outside Kansas City I went to Oklahoma State University for for college was a part of the baseball team there uh, enjoy my time. He, obviously, as you can see back there, orange and black for life, uh, go Pokes. <laughs> so I was a member of the baseball team there, um, was part of a conference championship team, was an academic all-conference award winner, all, athletic academic all-conference. So I was fortunate to be blessed with a lot of success uh, in, that, in that time period. Um, and then I was actually one of the few people that got drafted twice. So uh, in baseball, the way the rules are set up with the draft is you can actually uh, get drafted and then turn it down and return to school. So in 2014, after my junior year, I was drafted by the Tigers. Um, and after sitting down with my agent and, and my family and, and getting an offer from the team, I decided to turn it down and, and uh, return to school for my senior year and come back and get my degree. So in 2015, returned from my senior year. Uh, had an elbow surgery, got healthy, and then graduated with my degree in history uh, in 2015. And then in 2015, I was drafted again after my senior year uh, by the Milwaukee Brewers and signed with them in 2015. So got into, got into professional baseball with a college degree and got this bonus. First, first chunk of money that I ever got in my whole life. You know, I'm sure every athlete's kind of been there. I'm yeah. sure you had that situation where you're like, I, I know you can't get into specifics, but all right, give us the range. Cause I know baseball, you know, when they try to draft you, they give you like a large signing bonus. And then based on if you're going to, obviously there's very few players that go straight to the uh, MLB. So, you know, minors, and then you, you go straight directly. So um, talk about that. You know, I know you might, might not be able to give us the, the exact amount, but give us like a range. No, you're good. So, so I was definitely less than six figures. Uh, as far as what my, my signing bonus was, but then there was, like you said, there's a big range. Like I, I was sitting in the, in the hotel and one of my buddies, he was, he was getting ready to get a $600,000 bonus. And we sat in the hotel and the check came in. I'll never forget this. This was, this was a big moment. And this guy had a $600,000 check coming in the mail. And, you know, you, you look at it and you open up the check and it shows you like all your taxes withheld, all, all yeah. that. And then it shows you like the direct deposit number. And it was like 368 on six, 600K. And we were both <sighs> just like, wait yeah. a minute, you know, what? And I had a college degree, you know, I had a college degree in history and I did not have the financial education or, you know, the understanding of what was about to happen to us, you know, with, with that money that we were getting. So that was kind of my intro into, the, into being an athlete and having to pay taxes. Um, and I know you, you have a great article there talk on, on, the, on the website talking about your experience with, with dealing with your first CPA and, and all the taxes that went, went on with oh that. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's, it's, it's and when people talk about how much they make, you got to understand the difference between net versus gross. And, you know, your story is a great analogy of understanding that because, you know, Uncle Sam has to take his cut. Uh, federal has to take their cut. City has to take their cut. 
and you know there's expenses that you have to play in as well so um, that's a great story um, that people you know you may get this million dollar signing bonus five hundred thousand dollar signing bonus you know fifty thousand dollar signing bonus but you have to understand what you're actually walking away home with and um you know the better you understand that the better you are with your finances so um didn't mean to cut you off but you know continue with your story no that's 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 perfect you nailed it right on the head the difference between net versus gross a huge component of what we're trying to do when when i work with athletes as far as building out their financial plans uh, but kind of getting back into the story so 2015 i signed uh played that whole kind of first half season got home for the off season and I still just had the money sitting in my savings account, like didn't have any idea what to do with it. My mom worked in mortgage underwriting for forever. And she's like, well, I could put you in some contact with someone in investment management at my bank. And, you know, I was like, okay. And I had, I had seen the 30 for 30 on ESPN broke. You know, I, I re, you hear the stories all the time about athletes getting taken advantage of by advisors and bad actors in the industry and things like that. So I was like, okay. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do some research for myself first. Like I was, I've always been an avid reader. So I started reading, uh, trying to get in, get a little bit of education for myself before I was going to make a decision one way or another, whether it was do it for myself or give my money to somebody else. I wanted to have at least an idea of what I was walking into. Uh, so I started reading, I hit the books. I started with a, a random walk down wall street by Burton Malkiel, a great book for anybody trying to kind of get into into investing and trying to figure out their way. Great place to start right there. Um, read some of Jim Cramer's books and just really hit, really hit it hard and just tried to figure it out for myself. Um, Perfect. So basically the whole 2016 season, my second year in pro ball, that money was still sitting in a savings account, <laughs> still sitting there, not really doing anything, but I was educating, I was learning. Like it was that, it was like a motivation thing for me at that point. Like I needed to learn what I was gonna do with it. And I set a goal for myself that by the end of that year in 2016, I would know what I needed to do with it. Um, so by the end of that season, I, I decided that I was like, okay, I think I have a pretty good grasp on this. I'm gonna do it myself. Okay. It's not enough money to where I don't think I need to go out and hire an advisor, but I think I can start doing some simple stuff that I've learned and doing it for myself. And that was in the, the fall or yeah, the fall of 2016. And um, from there, just started investing my own money accordingly. And uh, later that off season, I was working in a restaurant just to make some little extra cash during, during, during the off season. And uh, there was this guy that would come in uh, almost every day and order lunch. He would order the same thing for lunch, sit down, read the Wall Street Journal and read different research reports. And so me, who had just started picking this up a little bit and like knew what he was looking at, I started chatting him up as I would, I would serve him his food. And eventually I was like, hey, can I have your business card? Um, and so I got his business card and his name was Jonathan Fink, the owner and president of Satya Investment Management here in uh, Over Overland Park, Kansas. So I uh, basically just sent him an email a couple of days later, just like, hey, 20 minutes and a cup of coffee. I'm yeah. just very curious on what it is you actually do. Like, I would just like to talk to you for 20 minutes. Don't want to waste any of your time. And he was like, yeah, absolutely. 20 minutes, a cup of coffee for sure. I can do that. So we met up a couple of days later, uh, just started telling him what I did, told him I was a professional baseball player, talk, started talking about investing and we just hit it off right away. Like yeah. we were just instant friends. So we stayed in touch that whole next year. So for a, basically a year, he be, kind of became my mentor. We talked probably once a week on the phone. Uh, and was going through that season, still managing my money, still playing, working my way through. Um, and by that point, you know, I was in the locker room at, during batting practice on my laptop, you know, looking at stock charts, reading the Wall Street Journal, whatever it was. Um, and teammates started getting curious about what I was doing. <laughs> you know, you see a guy on his laptop after batting All the time. practice, right? You know, he's not on his phone flipping through Instagram. He's looking at some squiggly lines on a chart that's not a hundred percent normal. No. You know what I mean? So, so people started asking me questions and there were guys who had, who, who asked me and say, Hey man, I have some money. Like, do you think if I gave this chunk of money to you, could you help me with it? Could you invest it for me? And at the time, the legal answer was no, I didn't have a license. I wasn't registered. No. None of that. Um, so that I had to tell them, no, went back that off season, fall of 2017, talked to Fink about it. And he goes, okay, you're ready. Like, let's go ahead and I'm going to sponsor you. You'll come work for me. We'll get you licensed. And then when these people start asking you questions about, can you help them? Now your answer can be yes. So, uh, 
played in the Arizona Fall League in fall of 2017, started studying for my Series 65 that whole off season, uh, and then ended up getting licensed in February of 2018. Uh, from there, I just started managing money for real. I was an investment advisor representative for Satya. Um, started bringing all my teammates and, and friends as clients in the baseball world um, and just kind of grew up from there. So the last two years in 2018, 2019 of my pro career, I was playing and investing people's money at the same time. And then that kind of brings us all full circle to what I'm doing now. Uh, in March, I decided to retire. There's the situation going on in the world with my personal situation as a baseball player, tough to find a job. So I decided to go ahead and and make the transition out and got hired here at Waterfront Advisors in Overland Park. Uh, we are a financial planning and investment management firm, and I've been working here since since May now. At... No, nah, man, I love everything about that. I think there's so much to unpack. First, I want to start off with, you know, obviously it's a unique time, you know, over this past year, year and a half with, uh, you know, COVID, the social injustice, you know, you know, teams, you know, trying to downsize. Um, what was this decision like? How you know, it's tough to come to terms with the retirement, but talk about that process, you know, when you finally decided to hang it up, um, do you feel like you were in a good place? You know, a lot of people struggle with, you know, their identity, but I feel like you've always had more to, you know, your your persona than just a baseball player. Yeah, and I, I can thank my mom for that. My mom always preached to me growing up, you need to be a well-rounded person. You're, you're not just an athlete. You know, she would get on me about my grades all the time, and she always tried to really hammer home the concept that like, yes, sports is there, but you're going to have to be good for something else later on in life. Um, and that's always really stuck with me. Um, so for me, yeah, like, it, it was a pretty smooth transition. I, I will say, you know, it does take a toll on you mentally when, you know, you're in that situation where for me, in my case, it was you either play until somebody rips the jersey off your back or tells you they don't want you anymore. Yeah. I just happened to fall into the camp that nobody wanted him, wanted me anymore. I couldn't, couldn't get a job. Nobody wanted to offer me a contract. So mentally that can be a little bit taxing. And then you stack on top of it, all the things that happened immediately after, you know, with the pandemic shutdown and everything like that, it could be a little bit tricky to navigate from a mental standpoint. Uh, but having that background and, and knowing that I had a skill and, and, a, and a license and, and something that I could do, after the fact, once I was done playing, it really helped me set me at peace and made the transition a lot smoother than it got, would be for, for a lot of people. No, that's what it's all about. I definitely want people to, you know, heed that advice. Another point that you made is like the concept of having a mentor, you know, being able to, you know, get open doors. Um, and then and on top of that, you know, being humble enough to get a side hustle, you know, not everyone, you know, people see athletes, not everyone's a millionaire. So, you know, making that extra income and then hope it, it for your situation, leading you um, to, you know, meet, you know, your mentor and someone that helped you, you know, get your foot in the door in the investment space. Um, talk about, you know, how athletes can, you know, find their mentors, you know, whether it's randomly at a restaurant or, you know, cold calling or researching something that they're passionate about, finding someone that, you know, works in that space and then going from there. Yeah, well, you, you nailed it right on the head with that last little bit, finding something that you're passionate about. Um, for me, my career started, it started as a, a need to know something, which turned into a hobby, which turned into a job, which turned into a career. Um, and that was something I ended up falling in love with pretty organically and got really passionate about in a really organic way. And that's the biggest thing is if you find something that you enjoy, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, philanthropy, investing, you know, law, politics, whatever it is. Uh, just finding something that you really gravitate towards. And then when it comes to finding a mentor, just look for people that are older and smarter than you. you <laughs> exactly. know? People and, that have done it, you know? Absolutely. And and the thing is, is is what people don't realize, especially for, for us as athletes, is we already have a platform and we already have a certain level of legitimacy because you you played at a really high level. You had success. If you played, you know, division one or professional sports, you've already shown that you have the ability to, you know, manage your time, uh, have discipline and have success in a, in a very competitive field. And those, those attributes translate over into the next, that next life. And people will want to work with you. You just have to go out and seek out people who have been there in that industry, done that. And 
it's it's as easy nowadays as sliding into somebody's DMs or just just shooting that email. You know, you got to shoot your shot. Facts. Right? You got if if you reach out and you're proactive and you, and you say, "Hey, like this I have been doing this in athletics. I am looking to get into this and you have clearly shown success in that field." People are going to resonate with you on that. If you tell them, look, I admire your success. I want to learn. People are going to give you 15 minutes. They'll, they'll pick up the phone and, or 20 minutes in a cup of coffee. I think that's a great way to meet, you know, 30 minutes in a sandwich, whatever it is. People will give you the time of day if, if you just are proactive about it. No, that's what it's all about. You know, be proactive instead of reactive. You know, you don't want to talk, wait towards the end of your career. And it's like, oh, okay, all right, now I got to start using all my connections. Like be active while you're playing, while you're, you know, you have a name presence, while you, you know, on top of your game, while you have the resources. Uh, I want to touch on, you know, your intro to investing in money management. Obviously, you mentioned some books, Random Walk Down Wall Street and some of Jim Cramer's books. Um but what is your strategy when it comes? And I know we have a disclaimer, definitely checking with your financial team before you take uh, mine or Jonathan's advice when it comes to, you know, how we handle our money. But what was your, your strategy in terms of, you know, overall portfolio and things that you learned when you first got started? Yeah, absolutely. So this is not investment advice. Waterfront Advisors is registered with the SEC. Um, we really split it up into that net cash flow, going back to the, the net cash flow that you talk about. Uh, especially when I, the work that I do with athletes is we really break it up into three buckets. Okay. We've got our now money, our later money, and then our forever money. Okay. And the key thing is, is that this is all net. All right. So we, going back to that original conversation is, you know, that if you sign for a million bucks, right, if you sign for a million, you're really, what's going to end up in your checking account is not a million. It's going to be <laughs> 550, 600, probably somewhere in that range because you got to pay Uncle Sam. And then the other part of it is you guys had a great discussion on Clubhouse a, a couple of weeks back on uh, agent versus business manager. Well, in, in, in the world that I mostly work in with baseball, agents are very important and you're going to pay them three to 5%. And, and a lot, there are very few athletes out there running without an agent at the big league level. And you're going to get, you're going to pay that three to 5% on that, on that face value. So if you sign for a million, you have a 5% agent commission, that's 50,000 out the door right there too. So we have to think about that. But then once we get that net cash flow, that first bucket now money. Okay. So that's, that's your near term. That's your near term cash flow. Now that's talking about making sure our rent's paid. That's making sure our bills are paid. That's making sure the phone stays on all that <laughs> stuff. Right. So, so the old saying goes, right. Cash is king. Yeah, and cash is king, but cash flow is probably God then because oh, okay. if you think if you think that you can spend more than you make on a monthly basis, that is not a sustainable lifestyle and you are destined for financial failure if you can't get that in order. You have to get some sort of idea of what's coming in and what's coming out on a month to month basis. Have to get an idea of what those expenses are. And you have your fixed ones, right? Like we talked about house, car, phone. Yeah insurance utilities those aren't yeah insurance those aren't going anywhere those stay and the other part about it is that we have to consider as an athlete you're only getting paid five or six months out of the year okay so when we talk about cash flow we're not just talking about for while you're getting paid right in the nfl you get those 17 game checks in the mlb right mlb you're going late march to end of september so um, mlb players don't get paid in the off season no wow no. interesting okay yeah so you're going you're going the whole off season. So you got to make sure that not only do you get your budget intact while you're making the game checks, yeah. you have to make sure that you can get through the six months of the off season. Cause nobody wants to be that guy where you're calling your agent two months to go in the off season and you need to go get a cash advance on, on next year's salary or something like that. Cause you didn't budget. Right. And that, there are stories of that happening. Wow. That is interesting. So that's, that's the personal finance part of, of, the financial plan is, is making sure that you know how much you've got going in, going out with that budgeting. Uh, and it, it's tough. It's, it's kind of, I like to tell guys, it's kind of like lifting weights and eating healthy for finance, right? It's the little stuff that you have to do on a consistent basis in order to be good in sports, right? You have to take care of your body. You got to put in the time. Conditioning sucks. I don't know one person that likes to condition, you know, <laughs> yeah, but, but if you, if you want to be great at what you do, you have to do it. And these are the same things on the financial side that if you do these little things now, you're going to have a much greater chance of success uh, going on 
later down the road and getting to the bigger picture items in your in your financial plan. No, I love that. So talk about, you know, the other buckets, you know, you said today, there's like expenses tomorrow, uh, forever. I know one principle that you love is, you know, the 10% rule. So always applying 10%, you know, to your, you know, tomorrow or your forever fund. Like, so can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll get into that second bucket, the later money. So this is kind of like our medium term uh, financial goals, right? So we're looking at, these are our bigger ticket items, right? You're talking about the cars, you're talking about the homes, talking about college education for when you have kids, things like that, right? And these are things that I'm a big believer in the law of attraction. And you want to you wanna push those goals out there. We want to we wanna put them out in the universe. We want to talk about them. We want to say that this is what I want to do. And then from there, then we're going to take our budget and we're going to allocate dollars every month into, into those plans, right? Whether it's a home, a car, you know, saving for your kid's college or something like that, right? For example, mm -hmm. with, with college education, if you start at zero and you contribute $100 per month for the 18 years until your kid is 18 and graduates and goes off to college, that's 216 months, okay? So at hundred bucks a month, with no, no increase in contribution, no nothing, you're at $21,600 right there just by automatically just going and doing yeah. it over a long period of time. Now, if you say we can get 5% on your money while we're doing that, now you're looking at $40,000 right? So you're, you're able to just slowly over time, build up these large, large sums and be able to set out and accomplish your goals down the road. If you do that. And then, like you said, going to that golden rule, saving 10%. Now we're getting into that forever money part of it. Okay. So mm -hmm. now that third bucket, the, the big one, that a lot of people get in trouble with, and a lot of people talk about the, the, the retirement fund. Okay. And that starts with your company sponsored retirement plan. Every league's got one. Every league's got one. The yeah. only one that doesn't, the only major sports league that doesn't is the NWSL. And I've been seeing some, some rumors, you know, Reagan, Megan Rapinoe and that, that ownership group are hoping to kind of push that um, as they start to move forward with that negotiation. So I hope that they get one as well, but MLB, NHL, NBA, NFL, WNBA, MLS, they all got them. They all yeah. got them. So you want to if be you, contributing. If you don't mind me asking, what's the percent, uh, what's the match for MLB? MLB is a two to one. Oh, so okay. every dollar you put in, you get two back from the league. Uh, the NBA is a dollar 40. NFL is two to one. And then the MLS is a four and a half percent match. I believe now they bumped it up. a little. Yeah, they bit. bumped it up. Yeah, they bumped they it up. They waited until I left to bump that up. I'm still kind of pissed, but yes. So Whatever. that, that, and that's exactly where everything starts. So we start with that 10%, right? If we can do 10% of our salary. And then if you're in major league minimum, right? I always tell everybody that if you're in the big leagues for the full season, you're maxing that out. You're putting yeah. all $19,500 that you can into it. And we're going to get that company match and max it all the way out to 58,000 a year. Cause that's the max, right? So you think about it, major league minimum right now is $535,000 and the maximum that you can contribute between employer and employee is 58,000. So you're right there at that 10% rule. If you just start with that, mm -hmm. that's, and that's the golden rule, right? So here's another book recommendation for you. The richest man in Babylon. Oh, yep. Yeah. Classic, book. classic book, right? Classic personal finance book and save 10% of your gold. That's the golden rule. So, so if we can accomplish that, we know we're going to be on a good, on a good pace. So what I always recommend to my athlete clients is after we've maxed out that 401k, so after whatever league you're in, we made that contribution. We did everything we could there. Now we're talking about our net, our net savings. So all that cash flow that's coming in, okay, now we're going to save 10% of that. So if we can save at least 10% of that, then we know that we're going to be in a pretty decent amount of shape to where we're going to start having money for it once we're done playing. And then the goal being to continue to bump those contributions up, right? If, if, we, if we go through the budget and we can do 15, all right, let's do 15. Oh. Okay. Hey, if, hey, if, wow, we had a good year. We've been keeping the expenses down. We can go 20 plus, even better. You know, if we're, if we're Pat once, I always tell guys, if you can get past 20% on your savings, on your, on your, on your net savings, you are going to have a really, really high chance of success. Uh, not just as a professional athlete, but as you move out of there and move on to the next chapter of your career.
No, yeah, it doesn't make a great point. I know this is not baseball, but uh, Darius Butler, I believe, uh, was a football player that was able to save up to 60%. And I know people were here, this was like, well, yeah, he's making $2 million. It's easy to live off 60%, but it's, it's important to understand the principles, you know, and like you said, 10% of, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, $500,000 contract or even $100,000, you know, that stuff adds up over time. So I really appreciate, you know, you sharing and giving insight to that. Uh, I want to take it back a little bit, too, because you talked about your first year, you know, not being comfortable um, investing, you know, not being comfortable making those moves yet. So you had your money sitting and saving. And, you know, some people would be like, oh, wow, you should have started earlier. But I want to highlight the importance of, you know, learning before you go. And, you know, I know you talked about it, you know, having a plan before you invest, you know, because if you invest without a plan, it's basically you might as well just go to Vegas, you know. So yes. uh, can you can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, what's funny is I, is I kind of chuckle looking back on it now, because I now that, you know, I'm in the position I am knowing I know knowing what I know about markets and how investing works. Yeah, that was a completely idiotic decision to just have that. <laughs> money sitting in savings and cash. I feel the but, same way, bro. I put my, I put my signing bonus in a CD account just cause I wanted to learn and I didn't know. So I was like, you know what? If I see it in my account, I might spend it. So I'm just going to put it in a CD and, but I'm just like, oh, if I could have just used it yep. with what I know now. Oh. Yes. That's I, we see that a lot. I see, you know, I'll bring in a new guy, you know, I had this bonus and I put it in a CD and we go and we unpack the CD, he sends me a statement, it's, and it's interest rate is like one, one or two percent. And I'm just like, how long? Have you, and you've had this for six years, man. OK, sounds good. Well, hey, we can't get that back now, but, you know, we're going to we're going to move forward. But um, for me, it was a comfort thing. And, and for any any person or any athlete in particular being in that public spotlight, it comes down to comfort level. You got to you got to trust the person that you're working with. Um, you know, and, and for me, seeing, seeing the, seeing all the signs, right. You know, the money managers have kind of have a history with athletes and I just wanted to learn for myself. I know I trust myself. I felt like I was a pretty smart person. Um, and I could figure it out and I, but it was a long, it was a multi-year journey to get there. And, um, a lot of people are not wanting to invest that time or that energy into doing it, but you can do some little stuff to help yourself. So you at least have a baseline knowledge. So when you do sit down in a meeting with someone like myself or another advisor, you at least have a basic understanding of questions to ask, what, what things you should be looking for, uh, and kind of at least have an idea of what you're going to be going into in that meeting. Oh, that's amazing. And can you talk about that? Because when you started, you know, you went on your own, you know, you felt comfortable enough to, you know, represent yourself when it came to your money management, but now you're on the other side. So talk about, you know, some questions that, you know, athletes need to look for when asking um, to work with a financial advisor to kind of clear that process. Cause we know we still see unfortunate situations where uh, financial advisors and, and athletes, you know, don't really work well together. And, you know, there's always, you know, unfortunate situations with that. So talk about it from your vantage point, you know, not having a financial advisor on your own, but now you're being a financial advisor. So talk about that. Yeah. So uh, it kind of goes, it kind of goes in two ways. One, a couple of the questions that you need to be asking. Number one, first and foremost, are you a fiduciary? You know, biggest F word in finance is fiduciary. Understanding that if they say yes, then that means that they have to work on your, on behalf of your best interests at all times, full stop. They are on, they are sitting on your side of the table. Uh, they are not selling you anything that is going to have a conflict of interest. Uh, and I think that is a huge, huge piece of it. Uh, and more advisors are moving into that fiduciary role, which is great to see. It's a, it's a good shift in this industry and I think a necessary shift. Um, and then the second, second question, you guys, Hey, Hey bro, how do you get paid? How, how do you make money off of me? Because at the end of the day, right. It, it's, it's true. At the end of the day, you are paying for a service and you should be eyes wide open as to how are you paying for that service? Are you paying a fee under assets? So are you paying commissions? And a big question to ask with any advisor is, do you have commissionable proprietary products? So you look at places, you know, like an Ed Jones or a Northwestern Mutual, they, they get hundreds of millions of dollars every year from mutual fund companies for the sales load charges where they get paid a commission to put you in certain types of funds. 
Uh, not every, not every financial firm is like that. Some are, some aren't. And that's something that you need to clarify with, with your advisor up front to figure out how are they getting paid and, and where do their interests lie as they are investing your money. Those are the two main keys that I would, I would encourage people to ask in any meeting with an advisor. No, nah, thank you so much. I think that's really important, you know, and don't be afraid to ask questions as athletes, you know, you, you're the ones hiring, you know, like you said, you're the one hiring the financial advisor to handle your money. It's not the other way around. So make sure that you are comfortable with who you're working with and ask questions that are definitely going to get you um, the answers that you need. Absolutely. And it goes back, you had a great tweet talking about building out your team, you know, building out your professional team. And that's, you know, fi financial advisors are part of that. The accounting team is a part of that. You know, your agent, your business manager, all of those different, all of those different pieces. Okay. Those are your team. Okay? And that, those four heads, usually, I don't know a ton of athletes with business advisors. There are some, but the agent accounting and financial team, that three headed monster, very common. And you just have to understand how those three teams are going to work together. Personally, I'm a proponent of keeping all three of those teams legally separate. Mm -hmm. your, your agent should never be your financial advisor. Yeah. All right. The financial advisor and the accountant are sometimes linked together, might be in the same firm, sometimes not. But those three, I, we keep them separate in our structure because each one of those is working for you. Right. And it goes Perfect. back to if one part of that team is not up to your standards, right? If your agent's doing a great job, your financial advisor's doing a great job, but you had a, you just had a whale of a time. Like your, your tax guy was just not cutting it last year. Guess what you can do? You, Hey, we'll go get another accountant. Yeah. You're out next guy up. Right. If just like, just like baseball. If you're not performing next guy up. Absolutely. And guess what? You as the athlete are a hot commodity. People want to work with athletes. That is an in-demand that is an in-demand thing where people want to work with athletes. People want to say that they have athletes as clients. So people will seek you out if you need the help. It, it is mm -hmm. not hard to find people that want to work with you if you're not getting the level of service that you expect. Oh, respect. So talk about, let's, let's break down this, um, this triangle that you said. So you got accountant, you got financial advisor, and then you got uh, agent. And that's in, in terms of building like the team, you would say that's the core. Yeah, that for okay. most athletes, those are the three people that you're going to be hiring to help you move throughout your career. Typically, it starts with the agent. The agent's usually the center center of influence in that relationship. They work the most directly with the athlete in most cases. I deal a lot with agents as far as just talking to them. Hey, what's going on? What, you know, getting salary projections, you know, what things like that. Um, and then the accounting team, they're doing the taxes, right? They're, they're the taxes. They, that, that's all they should be worried about. So firing, filing your multiple state returns, making sure your duty days and your jock taxes are, are paid correctly. Um, and, then, and then the finance team is investing the money, mm -hmm. right? So, and those, if you keep those three separate, it's kind of like government where you got the checks and balances, yeah. right? You know, that's, that's, that's the history degree and me coming out right there. But the checks and balances, because we're working together. I mean, I'm talking to your accountant. I'm sending him the tax forms. He's sending me tax forms. Agents got the contract. We're all working together. So if one of those teams is doing something sketchy or not on the up and up, one of the other two teams who are supposed to be competent professionals should pick that up pretty quick. So it just kind of leaves a, a level of accountability uh, and a level of protection for you as the athlete. Just another built-in layer uh, to make sure that not only are you hiring the right people, but they are actively working for you in your best interest. No, I love that. Thanks for sharing. You're definitely going to have to do uh, more uh, content around that, the, you know, the triangle, because I'm always talking to athletes about building their team and making sure their, you know, their team is structured, whether you have, you know, your core three, your starting five, your best 11, um, they're all working for you because you're as an athlete and CEO. So how can they help you, you know, establish your brand, establish your presence and, you know, as we dive deep, deeper into financial advising, uh, take us through the certifications, you know, so athletes can kind of get a, a, a better picture of, you know, what really goes on beside, be, behind, you know, Series 65, 66, 67, uh, CFP, CPA, all these different uh, certifications and, and, um, and licenses. Uh, what, give us like a, a 101 version. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So we'll just start with uh, the two basic ones. So you really, are going to hear about whether or not you're an investment advisor or a broker, broker okay. dealer. So those are the two main structures. And when we talk about uh, commissions versus 
asset-based uh, fees, that's how they're separated. So my firm, we are a registered independent advisory uh, firm. So that's RIA. Uh, and we all have series 65 exams. So we okay. all take the, the series 65 and that has, allows us to give us legal investment advice. We, we give advice. We have no commissionable products. We have uh, no proprietary products. We are open architecture. So we can invest in anything and everything. And we simply are advising clients as to where they're going to put their money as a part of their overall financial plan. Now a broker, they take a series seven. All right. So they take a series seven. Uh, those are going to be closer to your, you know, your big wirehouse firms like your Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, uh, Edward Jones, Northwestern Mutual, those type places. They do have commissionable products. They will be, they get paid off of the products that they actually put you in. They'll get a sales load um, as well as an asset under management fee. So just a, a slight difference in the structure. Um, but those are the two main licenses that, that you'll see in this industry is you either be a 67 or a series seven broker or a series 65 investment advisor. Um, and then as far as you go into advanced designations like the CFP, uh, CPA, CFA, those are the three big ones. Uh, so I'll just touch on those real quick. Uh, CFP is certified financial planner. Uh, that's, that's what I'm currently getting ready to start that undertaking. I just got accepted to University of Missouri, Kansas city for, yeah, for uh, master's program in financial planning. So I'll be taking undertaking that project here the next year. So. You don't rest, man. You don't rest. Never always getting better. <laughs> always getting better. Um, and then that is just actual financial planning, going in, putting in the plans, uh, working, working with clients directly as far as make, building for their retirement income, making sure that they have enough saved, uh, things like that. So it's just a higher level of certification for, for what it is that I do as far as a, an investment advisor and financial planner. Uh, then a CPA. So if you have somebody that's filling out a tax return for you, they should have a CPA. They should be <laughs> a CPA. Okay, so that's certified public accountant. Uh, they hold themselves to the highest level of standards as far as accounting is concerned. Uh, if you have somebody with the CPA, that means they are they have done their homework, they've done their due diligence, they they have passed the exam, and they are licensed to do tax returns. Um, very crucial for anybody handling your taxes. And then CFA, so CFA is Chartered Financial Analyst. Uh, our chief investment offer, Chris, Chris Harrington, actually has all three of these designations. Oh, that's a lot of schoolwork, I feel like. Yes. Oh, yes. He's a, he's a genius. <laughs> Just straight up genius. But uh, the CFA is Chartered Financial Analyst. So that is portfolio management. They are, that's a three-part test. It takes three years to get through. And you have basically shown that you know the ins and outs of uh, discounted cash flow analysis, portfolio research. Uh, and investment research is, is the designation that that carries weight for. So uh, three different areas of finance, but all very important. And when it comes to the overall plan. No, I love it. Thank you so much for that breakdown. I think it's important, you know, not only as athletes, but as individuals that we know, you know, the ins and outs of, you know, potential people that we, we, be, we may be working with. So with that being said, you know, as you, as we go into the new year, you know, new season starting, what advice would you have for any athletes, you know, starting out, you know, with their, with their, you know, career and with their, you know, money management? Um, seek out the resources available to you uh, as an athlete. There are more resources available now than even uh, five and a half years ago when I first broke into pro ball, or I'm sure even more, you know, your website, right? Your website did not exist when I, when I got into pro ball. Uh, it didn't, ex nothing like this existed when you got into soccer, I'm sure. So there's way more resources available to you. Um, and then just get out in front of it. If you can get a plan in place before the season starts, because once the season starts, you, you need to focus on your sport. That's, you should yeah. be an autopilot financially and, and all that. You should get it done and automate, right? If you can automate things like putting that, that putting that 401k contribution on autopilot where it just deducts right out of your check. You don't yep. have to worry about it, making it where you get an auto deposit into your investment account out of your check, like your check hits and it's gone, right? It goes straight to the investment account. Anything, anytime you can automate things, uh, it's just going to make it easier on yourself uh, and just make you not have to think about it to where you're just, you're doing the successful stuff automatically. Uh, with our financial plans, we only give our clients three to five goals for the whole year. That's all you can accomplish. Any, yeah. Anything more than that, you're trying to do too much. 
Just do three or five little things over the course of the entire year and watch how, how much your chances of success grow. I love that. I love that a lot. And where can people find you? I really appreciate you making the time. Um, for the for the listeners, make sure you guys check our website out. Jonathan does weekly, uh, actually, sorry, monthly uh, articles for us. And he, you know, he provides valuable content. Uh, I know he has one coming up soon. Uh, so make sure you guys check him out on our site. But um, for the ones that want more direct content, where can they reach you at? Uh, so you can find me on social media, uh, jparent46 on everything. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Jonathan Perrin. Um, and then you can also check out our website, waterfrontadvisors.com. I'd be more than happy to, to speak with anybody who has further questions. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty easy to find on, on online. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So thank you so much, Jonathan. We really appreciate it. Um, this was amazing. Um, for more context, make sure you guys check out the show notes. We're going to have, you know, all what everything that what Jonathan said um, about the book recommendations in that. Uh, with that being said, you know, make sure you guys check us out. Um, some takeaways that I was able to have, you know, net versus gross. I thought that was amazing. You know, Jonathan spoke about, you know, when you get your money, when you get your contract, you know, understand what you're, you're you know, you're, you're grossing versus what you're netting. I think that's very important. He also talked about learning on your own. You know, as athletes, you know, we've been as, as bad as I don't want to say, it, we've kind of been coddled, you know, as, as high level talent, you know, people help us out. But when we go pro, we need to be proactive in terms of, you know, being able to learn on our own. And that will allow us to make better decisions, um, provide better clarity, and ultimately um, give us more stability. You know, I talked about um, there's levels for advising. And I think not a lot of people uh, look at that. Like, not everyone needs a financial advisor off the back. You know, you might be, um, you know, I don't want to say a player that doesn't need a financial advisor, but the, the amount of money you're making may not be conducive to having a financial advisor at that point. So might as well, you know, save first, save first, understand what you're getting into, then invest. And then depending on the level that you're at, the comfortability, then you get a financial advisor. Um, cash is king, cash flow equals God. I thought that was amazing. Definitely have to break that down uh, even more. So it doesn't make sense if you're going to make a lot of money if you don't know how much cash flow you have. So Cash is king, cash flow equals God. I thought, I thought that was really good. And then the last one, last takeaway that I want to leave you guys with is the, the, the triangle core, uh, the checks and balances between an accountant, an agent, and a financial expert or team. Um, I think that's really important. The three key members that you may need on your team, um, those are the ones that you have to look at like right off the bat. So I um, hope you guys like the episode. Make sure you guys tune in every Tuesday. Um, but with that being said, catch you guys later.